Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing health equity with our special guest, Dr. Gail Christopher, Executive Director of the National Collaborative for Health Equity. And thank you so much, Dr. Christopher, for joining us. It's my privilege and pleasure to be with you today. Thank you, Mark. I want to set you up with this idea um, that is so obvious for anyone that looks at the numbers, that profound racial and ethnic disparities in this country are reflected, they're embedded in our health statistics, with people of color faring worse than their white counterparts across a wide wide range of health measures, including life expectancy, infant mortality, pregnancy-related deaths, prevalence of chronic conditions, and other measures of physical and mental health. So, Gail, if if you don't mind, could you just outline for those of us who are less experienced in your world how NCHE helps institutions and leaders expose these disparities and provide guidance in healing those disparities? Well, first, we should begin, I think, by understanding that they are inequities. Uh, for many, many decades, we called them disparities, and, and that basically meant differences, right? But as the field evolved, we recognized what we're dealing with are the consequences of inequities in opportunities to be healthy, that racism literally lives in the body. It settles in the body. It's kind of like the delta, you know, of the great rivers. And so... When we think about overcoming health inequities, these uh, disproportionate burdens of chronic disease and diseases, be they chronic or inflammatory or viral, we really have to think in terms of the social determinants of health and well-being. And those have to do with where we live, where we work, where we play, how much opportunity we have to be healthy. And that, of course, you know, we've called the social determinants. But in America, that's driven by our structures of of hierarchy of human value. So understanding that what we are dealing with is the, the embedded racism, the embedded permission to devalue some people and value others based on their physical characteristics, particularly their superficial characteristics, we at the National Collaborative for Health Equity, we have learned over the 20 years of our work that we have to deal with racism. If, in fact, we're going to close those those gaps and improve health outcomes in a sustainable way. So you're forging a link in in your um, use of words by choosing inequity as opposed to disparity, right? Mm-hmm. Disparity is more neutral. Yep. Inequity is basically recognizing that the source of these differences is not neutral. Exactly. It's actually connected to justice. It's connected to history. It's connected to attitude. It's connected to so many different things. So health is just a downstream consequence in this in this respect of racism it's not the only thing that affects health but it's certainly that attitude with that is embedded within american society and history has actually a downstream consequence in the health of people of african american descent and other um other uh, uh peoples who have mm-hmm. suffered the same type of trauma exactly Um, It is about opportunity and the lack thereof. We understand that to be healthy requires the opportunity to consume the right foods, to have a living wage, to live in a safe community, uh, to uh, have the amount of movement and exercise that's important. And, And most importantly of all, to not be bombarded with the chronic stress that creates an allostatic load on the body's organs and systems that predisposes to premature breakdown and degeneration. 
And so all of these things are a consequence of living in a society that does not provide equitable access to opportunity for healthy living. Now, at the National Collaborative for Health Equity, our areas of work are in three primary areas. The first is we support leaders around the country who get this and who are working to change systems and structures within their local communities. We support them in some ways monetarily. We support them by bringing them together to network with one another and to become immersed in the science and the knowledge that they need to do their work more effectively. We also have a focus on data, research, and information. And we have a, a, a wonderful project funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that's called the HOPE Data Initiative. And there, with some expert guidance, uh, my predecessor in this role, Brian Smedley, they put together an interactive website that reframes the discussion away from just naming the disparities and inequities to actually naming what it would take and quantifying what it would take to achieve health equity. So we tell states, if you had, let's just say, 300,000 more people who were making a living wage, that would move your state toward a goal closer to health equity. Or if you reduce the environmental toxins, or if you have more access to, to, to affordable, safe housing, you know, and but we quantify that. And so, and we call that the HOPE Data Health Opportunity Data Initiative. And so we're really focused on providing the resources to help fuel this movement to change these conditions. And then finally, uh, we are supporting the brave communities around this country that are engaged in truth, racial healing and transformation. And that's a truth process for this country, similar to the truth and reconciliation efforts in South Africa and in 40 other countries around the world. But in my last years as senior advisor and vice president at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, we introduced and designed a process of truth for this country, right? Which it has to be more than catharsis. It has to be more than just, you know, talking heads and people telling their traumatic stories. It really has to be changing the story of America, bringing diverse communities together for coalition building, and then tackling the policies that structure, it's more than attitudes, it's policies that structure inequities. We have a, a project called Healing Through Policy that we've done with the American Public Health Association and the De Beaumont Foundation, where we curated a lot of the policy and practice changes that people are putting in place around this country to achieve health equity. So that's the broad summary of our work in those three categories, but it's all fueled by a vision for an America without racism. And when we reach an America without racism, we'll have an America without these health inequities. It's it's interesting how you frame this, because in a sense, the culture wars that are being waged right now is in opposition to this type of, of uh, progress of, of dialogue amongst people at different ages and amongst people of different backgrounds. It's basically creating a, um, a separate um, education for people based on what their um, ethnicity is and what their age is, as opposed to a dialogue in which people have to look at history and uh, deal with it from at, at different age levels. You know, when you're when you're five years old, when you're 10 years old, when you're 20 years old, when you're 50 years old. Right. So do you uh, also connect this whole educational movement that that you're seeing? with uh, objections to the teaching of African-American history and, and so on and so forth to these health inequities that, you know, that you're saying? I appreciate you bringing that up. You know, we've been at this for 25 years. And uh, so we view the most recent um, iteration of resistance to the change, the inevitable transformation of our country 
we we view it as resistance to the progress that was being made. And this particular loud and persistent noise was politically contrived um, to 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 divide the country, you know, to politicize education. So, but we know that this work has been going on without that for a very long time. And if your intention is really to bring people together, and our intention is that, and it's there, it's evident, you know, we bring people together and we don't bring people together to blame and to shame and to harangue and to make folks feel guilty. We bring people together so that we can collectively change our relationship with the past. We can't change the past. But we can change our relationship with the past and we can make it a relationship that catapults us into a future that honors the equal humanity of all. And so the way we approach this, we view this work as healing work. We don't view it as gotcha. We don't view it as polarizing and dividing. We view it as an opportunity to affirm the humanity of all of us and to work together to actualize our democratic ideals. And, and so, you know, the, the media has termed this, uh, you know, culture wars, but that, that, those, are, those are euphemisms for political gain. But, but it's really not about that. It's really about the heart of our democracy and the evolution of our democracy toward its aspirational goals. And that's going to take all of us working together. It strikes me that if we just saw uh, communities, cities, the country, as if we were one family, yeah. and in, in our family, the those who are in trouble get help from other family members, right? If, if, if they're in psychological distress, if they're in physical distress, um, we come together. And what you're saying is we ought to come together and just like in any family, we have disagreements, right? So we talk it out. Doesn't yeah. mean that we're going to end up with all the same opinions. That would be kind of boring. But that's really what you're what you're talking about, isn't it? I mean, it, I just, it, it really is. It, it really is, and it is happening. It's happening in over seventy two college campuses around the country. It's happening in dozens of places around the country, and in organizations that that work with thousands of groups. Uh, this is happening. You're not going to hear about it on Fox or MSNBC, but it is happening because we are an extended human family. We all trace our ancestry back to the original humans that were found in Africa. And so in many ways, quite literally, we are an expansive human family. And what we need is to learn how to be empathetic, how to be compassionate, how to extend love to one another because we need each other. And if COVID didn't show us anything, it should have revealed our interdependence and our interconnectedness within not only this society, but across the globe. So indeed, it is possible. But Mark, it's about developing skills and, you know, anything that we master, we master it because we practice doing it. And America has to practice this positive approach to affirming the humanity of all of us. How do we bring people into, into the tent who are separated in their own information spheres and are separated by race? They look around and they, they cluster together with people who look like them. You know, the DNA might not be different, but that visual cue creates that difference. How do we, how do we, because, I mean, we can talk to the converted, right? You can talk with me, and I'm, I'm probably more in your camp than, than other people uh, might be. I can talk with somebody else who's more in my camp. But isn't, it, isn't the point that we're trying to bring more people into this, this discussion? How yes. Do you that down? Yes, we, we are doing it. Uh, I want to recommend a wonderful book and all honesty, it was written by my daughter, Heather McGee, but it's called The Some of Us. And it's a New York Times bestseller. And it really does chronicle a lot of the work that's happening in this country where people are solving problems together. And one of the ways we do it is to 
to come together to solve a problem that we see reflects our mutual interests. So that's one approach. The approach that I've embodied, you know, in my book, Rx or Prescription Racial Healing, it has to do with deliberately reaching out using our nonprofit sector, using organizations to, to actually hold circles where we invite people to come in and, and not talk about race or racism, but to come in and tell and share our stories, our human stories. Uh, we've trained thousands of practitioners to, to facilitate, to co-facilitate these types of circles. And in fact, it's always co-facilitated to model people who look very different, who are from different races, you know, different gender identities, perhaps different parts of the country, but they come together and they facilitate these circles of story sharing. It's really about our story. We can't change the past, but we can change our relationship to the past. And we can accomplish that by learning to listen with empathy and compassion, but it is work. And it isn't something that, you know, you're going to get in a soundbite on, on, a, on a cable news program. It is something that you have to do. I really do applaud the Kellogg Foundation. They have, have supported. This was our seventh year now. Every year we have a National Day of Racial Healing that follows the Martin Luther King Day celebration. We deliberately pick the day after MLK Day, and it's the National Day of Racial Healing. And literally communities across this country are setting that day aside to do this kind of work, not to call people out, but to call people in to the very kinds of, of story sharing and empathy building and compassion building that is necessary quite honestly, if our democracy is going to survive. I like what, you, what you're saying about the idea of coming together and making it about everyday life as well, right? We want to have a, a healthy city. It is not good to have homeless encampments around healthy cities. Yeah. We want to have healthy cities, livable cities. It's not good to have so many people who are ill and yeah. are not um, do, don't have access to medical care, right? So in a sense, we're, we don't have to talk about race to be talking about race, do we? Exactly. And that's the beauty of the methodology, Mark. Some people have criticized and said, but you're not asking questions about race. And I say, if you sit in a circle with 24 people and your prompts are dealing with basic human needs, right? Stories about basic human emotional and needs. If that circle is diverse, you're gonna hear stories about racism. You're gonna see the reality of the structure of our society, but you're not gonna hear it in an adversarial way. You're gonna hear it from the heart and you're going to be moved by these stories. You know, after you listen to 24 different stories, You'd be surprised. You'll leave that experience seeing the world differently uh, because your heart has been touched. And so we we support communities that are doing this work. We train facilitators. We know in our heart that we will never end health inequities until we transform the cultural ethos of this country into one that is no longer denying its past, but has learned from its past and present for that matter, and is 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 driven by a genuine commitment to the, the love of humanity. And, and that's work. And that's work we don't have in our curricula right now. We need it. Do we have to give each other a break a little bit for our ignorance? We do. Grace is required. Absolutely. Absolutely. So again, we're not calling people out. We're calling people in to 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 feel and to be affirmed as human beings. So once once we we get to the point where we are communicating, we are we are feeling that we're listened to but also we've listened. And we're ready to act together, you and me and others. What is what is what should that action be? When when does the dialogue um right. when is it time to move from dialogue to actually doing something very specific? 
Well, and that's where the the broader framework uh, we have a the truth racial healing and transformation process has a framework that has five pillars, and though and that framework undergirds all of our work at the National Collaborative. But the first pillar of the framework is what we call narrative change, right? And that has to do with our projections, if you will, of who we are as a country, whether it's in the media or in the textbooks, right? It's it's finding a way to expand our narrative to engage all of us. The second pillar is this work of racial healing and relationship building. It's this work of building trust that is building bridges of trust that can carry the weight, you know, of the truth, right? And that's what we've just been talking about. But the bottom three pillars of the framework, we asked ourselves, if this idea of a false hierarchy of human value, if it has lasted for all these centuries, how has that happened? Because if we know how it's happened, we know how to reverse it. And so the bottom three pillars of the TRHT framework are separation, overcoming and reversing the legacies of segregation, of separation in its myriad forms, right? The the fourth pillar is the law, making sure that we make the policy changes that we need to that will afford equitable opportunity to all. And then the final pillar is the economy. We maintained racial hierarchy in our society through our enforced separation, through our legal systems, and not just the criminal justice system that we've all been made acutely aware of with the disproportionate killings of black men and brown men and women, but through our immigration policies, you know, through our access to the vote. There's so many aspects of the legal structure of our society and our governance that were designed in the age of of racial hierarchy. And so we have to address those specifically. And then of course, we have to design an economic structure. If if racism did nothing else, it fueled this economic system that we have that has such disproportionate, you know, widening gaps in access to employment, in wealth. And so those are the five pillars of the work. We deliberately designed a comprehensive approach because it isn't one or the other, it's all of the above. Is part of the point here is that that there is a rejoinder to what you're saying is history is history. Let's put it behind us. Is part of the rejoinder to that is that history is today and history is never behind us, right? We have to keep working it. Is that is that part of the philosophy here? It is that we have to to see and to understand history. We have to have an awareness of history, but our relationship to that history has to be one of of grace and commitment to move forward together. You know, I'm of two two minds uh, on this, and it comes to me from my own family experience. Um, My my, uh, grandparents, for example, lost everything and could have lost their lives um, and fortunately escaped. Um, and my grandmother's view was a mixture of noting history, but also putting it behind her. It was it was interesting. And I've talked with people out of um, the Greenwood section of Tulsa, uh, where we, mm-hmm. we also did the search for Greenwood Rising. And you get that same kind of sense, right? Traumatized peoples have this sort of dialogue within themselves about putting the past behind, but also honoring the past. Um, memory versus uh, moving forward. How does that? How does that work? Are we are we anchored in the past to such an extent that we can never move forward? Are we, if we move forward, are we forgetting the past or disrespecting it? Are we not seeing things that we ought to see? How do you see this scale? You know, I believe that it is about relationship, and it is about integrating. An experience. It's sort of like if you personally say like your grandmother, you know, or or people in my family in, you know, my mother's generation, if you have personally experienced trauma yourself, you know, there has to be interventions to enable you to integrate that experience and connect with your resilience. Connect. You are not defined by your trauma. We are not. Def- we are more than our trauma. 
right? And and that's the work. It's that, that's the work at the individual the work level. Work is redefining the trauma so that we can together move beyond it. That's that's at a societal you're... level, absolutely. At an individual level, it's integrating the experience so that your resilience, your agency, your competency, you know, and so many people in this work, they only focus on trauma. But trust me, there had to be so much more than that, or we wouldn't be here. So when we talk about telling a narrative of the past, it's not just the traumatic narrative, it's the narrative of coalition, it's the narrative of resilience, it's the narrative of, of overcoming. But, but being aware of that and understanding the human frailty, the human courage, you know, the human stamina, and then integrating that understanding into our commitment to moving forward together. This is so very helpful, your, your connection of education, transgenerational life experience, traumas both large and small, with health today, the health of a, of a woman who is pregnant, the health of a young man who um, has experienced and whose father and whose father's father experienced certain um, uh, types of lives and how that, that accumulates within our bodies and within our souls is so very helpful. Dr. Gail Christopher, Executive Director of the National Collaborative for Health Equity, thank you so much for understanding your work, for helping us understand your work. Thank your staffs. Please thank your board members. Please thank your donors and your partners for this important work that you're doing. Well, the, the conversation has been wonderful. Thank you for inviting us to be part of it. And thank you for spreading the word because that's what we need to do, right? We need to counter these extreme narratives that, that really don't show the goodness, that don't show what we're capable of as a human family. Well, I enjoy being your student and a, and having a slight repair in my ignorant state. So oh. thank you. You're welcome. Take care. Thank you. It's been a great conversation.